Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, good morning to you all. It is indeed uh, a pleasure to warmly welcome you to IPI for this event, an agenda for the people, by the people, consolidating peace and advancing development in Sierra Leone. We are honored to co-host uh, this gathering with the government of Sierra Leone and Catalysts for Peace. And thank you all for coming. I'm sure it has been a long week for everybody, and it's early in the morning. In the last week, uh, the UN celebrated the Climate and SDG Summits. Both events have received a wave of support across the world. On Wednesday, member states adopted a political declaration calling for accelerated action to achieve the 2030 agenda. There is, I think, growing recognition that we need to change our approach to meet our goals and targets. The unique experience of Sierra Leone can shed light on how to accelerate the SDGs through a people-centered approach. It serves as a useful example to offer for West African nations and actually beyond. In the last week, IPI has hosted over 10 events. A recurrent theme has been the crisis of multilateralism. <coughs> and in this climate of polarization, the 2030 agenda remains an uncontested framework. It brings all nations together. The SDGs not only represent the universality of the UN, but also offers a shared vision for a path forward in these troubled times. Before moving uh, to our panel, it is now my pleasure to welcome uh, Francis Algali, Minister of State for the Office of the Vice President of Sierra Leone. You have the floor, uh, Francis. Good morning, everyone. It is with pleasure and pride that I make these opening remarks at this side event on the One Fumble National Development Framework, an agenda for the people, by the people, consolidating peace and advancing development in Sierra Leone. Sometimes in periods of crisis and adversity, new innovative ideas emerge to address the prevailing issues that we may be confronted with. As you may be aware, Sierra Leone has gone through a 10-year civil war, Ebola virus disease epidemic, natural disasters of flooding and mudslides due to human activity and climate change, and several presidential and parliamentary elections during which there were incidences of violence. In all of this, we have come out as a strong and resilient country with a common sense of purpose not to repeat the mistakes of the past. The One Fumble National Development Framework is an innovation born out of the desire by Sierra Leoneans and our international friends to maintain the peace and national cohesion of our country after all the tribulations and to ensure that communities have a voice in their own development and in harnessing resources for their own well-being. The New Direction government, under the leadership of His Excellency President Julius Madabio, after the bitterly fought presidential and parliamentary elections and the incidences of violence that occurred following the announcements of the results, charged the Honorable Vice President, Dr. Mohamed Jul Jajalo, with the responsibility of spearheading efforts to promote post-elections healing and social cohesion. One of the organizations we approached to roll out the activities was Fumble Talk International. In our interactions, the office of the vice president was presented with the one Fumble framework for national development, which had been piloted as a tool for promoting peace, community healing, inclusive governance and development, and social cohesion. Realizing the potential of the process the Honorable Vice President, who is also Chair of the Interministerial Committee on Local Government and Decentralization, put together a com committee comprising myself, 
the Minister of Planning and Development, the Minister of Local Government and Rural Development, together with Talk, to work together to incorporate this framework into local governance process. This is currently ongoing, and we are proud to say that the government has come together to work on this. The prospects of the framework are huge and would enhance and facilitate the achievement of the sustainable development goals. Some of the drivers of conflict that we all know are lack of access to resources, communities feeling left out and not having a say in charting their destiny, communities not having avenues to voice their concerns, and the framework addresses all of these in a unique and innovative way. It is currently being nurtured through an exceptional collaboration between national government, civil society, and international partners, and we call on the global community to support this framework and adopt it when necessary. With these few opening remarks, I hand you over to the panel to share with you the One Fumble National Development Framework an agenda for the people, by the people, consolidating peace and advancing development in Sierra Leone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, and welcome to everybody. Um, it is truly unique for IPI to focus only on one country. We usually, at the multilateral level, we, we focus on multiple countries in a panel. But we decided to solely focus on Sierra Leone because of the unique story and experience you're about to hear. It is absolutely amazing how Sierra Leone has been able to overcome so many of its challenges and do it in a, in a way that's people-centered through multi-stakeholder partnerships. So it is truly, truly an honor to be sitting here uh, with all the esteemed colleagues. We also have SRSG uh, Chambas that will also be able to zoom out and, and look at the West African uh, uh, region as a whole and beyond. But you know, as a, as a negotiator that uh, developed uh, the 2030 agenda, we were very explicit on what we wanted and, and, and who, in a way, who wanted to do that. But we, we left out the how. We didn't say how we were going to do it, and that's the hardest part. And so, so Sierra Leone is telling us how, and this is a very important experience that can help other countries as well see how we can accelerate action. So with that, you have the bios on, the, on your uh, seat, so I will not uh, waste time on that. I have my little uh, globe here, so when the six minutes are up, I'm going to raise it like this, and when the seven minutes are up, it's the shark that's coming to eat the time. Uh, this, this will ensure that we'll have enough time for an interactive discussion, which is often the most enriching part of the meeting. So please prepare also uh, uh, your questions for the interactive session. Thank you so much for coming on a Friday. You're all champions. <laughs> so with that, Ambassador uh, Francis um, Kaikai, he was the former PR of Sierra Leone and is now back in his country. Ambassador, welcome back. You have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator. Um, excellencies, distinguished participants, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's been a very exciting uh, SDG Summit Week. Uh, I know we've all been very busy doing one thing or the other, uh, but what is clear this week is that there has been overwhelming support for the SDGs and the, you know, all the 17 goals. Um, it, we all agree progress is slow after four years, now going to the fifth. Uh, and one of the ways forward for accelerating the SDG implementation, clearly recommended by most of the panels I've listened to this week, uh, is localizing SDGs. And uh, localizing it, I think, is the way forward. So I am really pleased this morning to join uh, my colleague ministers from Sierra Leone, uh, the Minister of State and the Minister of Local Government, uh, to participate in this very important event, uh, which I think is uh, clearly um, showing the way towards uh, sustainable pathways to prosperity. I wish to thank uh, IPI and uh, Catalyst for Peace USA for co-organizing this event. Um, I should also thank Fambul Talk, Sierra Leone, through Mr. John Kolka, 
for working with these two global institutions to facilitate this event and for enormous investment in the inclusive local development model of Sierra Leone that we are here to showcase. Um, the minister just said it, uh, that, uh, you know, it's true that in every crisis there is an opportunity. And indeed, for post-conflict Sierra Leone, uh, crisis response and recovery strategies have left us with uh, sustainable development models to help transform our nation uh, going forward. Uh, there are many examples of uh, what we have done. And the last time it was the Ebola that became the global headlines. And uh, we also saw how action at the local level made a huge difference in fighting it. Now, one of the uh, critical post-conflict rural development models we have been left with is the People's Planning Process Framework, commonly referred to as the One Fumble Talk. Um, this framework has been nurtured for years and successfully piloted uh, by Fumble Talk, one of our major local NGOs, in partnership with US-based Catalyst for Peace. Convinced that the tremendous potential this people-centered model has for the socioeconomic transformation of Sierra Leone, our government has cooperated with Fumble Talk and Catalyst for Peace to develop a national framework to replicate this model across the 190 chiefdoms and 16 districts of the country. It is pleasing to note that the social mobilization and community reconciliation and healing platforms established by the One Fumble uh, in three pilot districts have been turned into viable economic development financing structures uh, for those localities. Uh, for instance, one family pilot institutions such as the Peace Mothers Group, created in the process, have pursued joint local business ventures with their own capital. And a recent assessment of the economic potential of this framework suggests that if Peace Mothers Group can be formed in all 190 chiefdoms and 16 districts of Sierra Leone and empowered with income generating support in their localities, millions of dollars in revenues can be generated through these structures. The report of the assessment is available at Fumble Talk Organization in Freetown. Therefore, I strongly believe that the replication of this model is feasible and worth pursuing across Sierra Leone. Replicating it is highly fundamental to achieving the SDGs in the country. Uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me use this opportunity to sp speak to a related development. That is that our government, led by uh, President Biu, has recently launched and begun to implement a new medium-term national development plan for the period 2019 to 2023. The process leading to this plan was highly participatory, informed by consultations, across all districts, involving the lowest level of community governance, including ward and children level representatives. Largely, therefore, the national plan is already informed by the people's planning process we are showcasing here. Accordingly, I'm pleased to mention that we have advanced preparations to effectively take the national plan to all 16 districts, starting mid-October. All paramount chiefs, local councillors, women, youths from ward committees will be engaged in this nationwide undertaking to enhance grassroots understanding of the new national plan and their roles and responsibilities in its process. Our development partners, uh, including NGOs, um, civil society, and representatives of all those that supported the plan preparation will join this nationwide exercise to decentralize the ownership of the plan implementation to the people. In this regard, ladies and gentlemen, we hope to leverage the pilot success of the One Fumble Framework discussed here to help all local communities adopt the National Development Plan. As I conclude my remarks, let me underscore a major prerequisite for achieving our shared national development objective, that is coordination. Uh, we need to strengthen coordination and reporting at all levels in service delivery. We have coordination in the Fumble Talk Framework. <coughs> We are here to discuss, and our government remains committed to taking it forward, together with Fumble Talk, Catalyst for Peace, and other partners who are willing to come forward. Uh, this framework has a promise for Sierra Leone's transformation, and my Ministry for Planning and Economic Development has seen it as an effective instrument to strengthen national development planning. At this juncture, let me once again thank the 
Institute for Peace, Catalyst for Peace, for bringing all of us together on this important dimension to our country's development. We look forward to sustained engagement to see through our aspirations of the people's planning process as a true model of economic development in, in Sierra Leone. So it's all about the people, for the people, by the people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Minister. Now we turn to SRSG Chambas. Uh, thank you for being here. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, let me recognize uh, colleagues here on the high table, especially my brother and friend, uh, Minister Kakai, honorable ministers of Sierra Leone, other officials of Sierra Leone who are here, uh, distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen. Since I don't want the globe thrown at me or worse yet, <laughs> swallowed up by a shark, <laughs> let me get on with it. <laughs> I am honored to be here today, and I'd like to commend the International Peace Institute and Catalyst for Peace for their commitment to showcase the government of Sierra Leone in its remarkable efforts to achieve peace and prosperity. I'm particularly pleased to be with you because the United Nations has been constantly accompanying Sierra Leone throughout its journey towards democratic consolidation and sustainable development. Undoubtedly, the country in recent years has made great progress in the areas of peace building, security sector reform, promoting the private sector, and rebuilding democratic institutions. The people of Sierra Leone have demonstrated their ability to recover from the devastation of civil war, the Ebola crisis, and major disasters such as deadly flooding. The country has conducted four democratic elections, each in challenging environments. The 27, 207, and 218 elections led to a peaceful alternation of power from a ruling party to the opposition. In particular, the 2018 elections held after the withdrawal of the UN mission marked an important milestone in the country's democratic consolidation. In May 2019, the government renewed its commitment to national cohesion and political tolerance with the organization of the Mintamani Three Conference, and I myself I was pleased to be there. We should recognize also the role of the One Fumble National Framework, a new approach to community reconciliation, which is helping the people of Sierra Leone use local traditions to address communal tensions. Economic performance and social equity have also been high priorities. I'd like to commend His Excellency President Madabio for his government's flagship program of free quality education. And I should say that this was one of the things that uh, came up in the bilateral between Secretary General and President Bio. And Secretary General was especially uh, pleased about the commitment that President Madabi was showing to young girls' access to education and allocating 21% of national budget to the sector. Great emphasis has also been put on the fight against corruption and the promotion of accountability. Distinguished friends, in April 2016, the UN General Assembly and the Security Council adopted two resolutions on peace building, launching our sustaining peace approach, which aims at preventing the outbreak, escalation, continuation, or recurrence of conflict. In January 2017, the Secretary General put conflict prevention for sustaining peace at the heart of the UN's agenda, stating that the best manner to prevent society's relapse into conflict is to strengthen their resilience through investment in inclusive and sustainable development and the concerted action on climate change. The government of Sierra Leone has thoroughly articulated this prevention outlook in the new medium-term National Development Plan 2019-2023 through education and a resilient economy the country will strengthen national cohesion. 
The UN stands ready to accompany the plan and advocate for the support of development partners to achieve the goals it sets out. Distinguished friends, while great progress has been achieved, we should not overlook the remaining challenges in terms of political, security, social, and economic conditions. Political tensions since the March 2018 elections call for the continuous attention of the region and the international community. The government, political parties, civil society organizations need to work closely together to preserve the critical democratic gains achieved over the last 70 years. In this regard, we very much welcome the meeting between former President Koroma and President Madabio. That handshake, I think, sent very positive vibes across the country, and we would like that communication to be maintained. We commend the engagement of the government of Sierra Leone to reduce gender inequalities and improve social protection for its people. We welcome the government's resolve to curb the spate of sexual and gender-based violence with the official launching of the Hands of Our Girls flagship program of First Lady Fatima Biu. And ending child marriage, investing in girls' schooling programs, and reducing teenage pregnancy are critical steps in empowering women. Today, the growing threat of terrorism in West Africa and Sahel also puts yet another strain on coastal countries in the region, including Sierra Leone. In this light, it is of utmost importance that we pursue peace-building efforts and support sustaining development across the region. This will be the best way of preventing violent extremism. Let me conclude by reiterating the United Nations commitment within the framework of UN 2030 agenda to assist Sierra Leone on its path to peace and stability for a prosperous future for all Sierra Leoneans. And I thank you, Amen. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so very much. And it was um, your, your statement really kind of um, is a perfect uh, combination of what we're going to be hearing next, which is um, we will hear how this model got created, the, the uh, people, process, community-based model. Uh, John, you've been uh, the executive director of Ambletok. And um, as SRSG Chambas mentioned, in order to uh, prevent and ensure the gains made so far, how, uh, why did you create this, this uh, process and how do you see it moving forward? Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. In order to avoid the shock, yeah. I will stand on existing protocols. <laughs> um, Basically, the idea of the inclusive governance process started as a way to address the mistakes made during the post-war reconstruction process. Um, during the post-war reconstruction, a couple of mistakes were made, not intentional. Um, a lot of money was spent in Sierra Leone, big projects, but most of them were driven from the outside, um, designed from our offices in um, in Freetown or either from different parts of the world. So during the Ebola and towards the end of the Ebola, we were concerned, how can we avoid such mistakes? Because Sierra Leone was galvanizing international support to address the post-Ebola um, recovery process. So Fambu Talk, we are a community-owned and led reconciliation process leading to development. So we went back to the community where the Ebola first struck in Kailau district, the very village where it started. And we said, look, we know you have the capacity to address your problems. How can we, how can we accompany you? Let's look at local solutions to local problems. We started with consultations. We brought community, we brought community members together with simple questions. What's your experience during the Ebola? How can we avoid such mistakes moving forward? How can we um, develop a resilient community that will be in a better position to address future shocks? Um, we 
were um, surprised that people already knew what they wanted. The first meeting, they said, okay, yes, we, we are, uh, the, the women were not talking during the first meeting. They said, okay, let's go back to the enjoy board. Let's come up with a different approach. Let's invite two women and one man from each village. And when they came together, we observed women were consulting each other. They were like hanging heads. Said, okay, let's probe. What are you saying? Explain to us. They were coming up with suggestions. The women suffered during the Ebola. They suffered more during the war. So how can we give them that space? Fast forward, during the consultation, it came clearly that the people know what they want and they identified their priority needs and at the end of the consultations, over three to four months, what we had was a people's planning process. They identify their needs, they identify strategies how to get to their needs. For example, um, in one community, the women said, look, our community is far from the health center. We want our own local health center. We said, okay, fine. How can we accompany you? Farm we Talk is not a donor organization or a development organization. We don't have huge, huge resources. So we said, look, you have local materials, you have the land, you have the mold, you have the sticks. What else? Let's work with you to come up with um, a plan, come up with a farming um, strategy. They will farm for one or two seasons to buy the materials that are not available within their communities. So it was clear that people already know what they want. They have the strategy and they have the resources. What was clear was linking these, these development programs with the national process. So after the first consultation in Kailang, we came together and invited the district council, the local um, government. We said, look, the people know what they want. This is their plan. How can you plug this plan into the district development process? I said, okay. We organized a district um, stakeholders meeting where the people presented this plan to the council. And at that meeting, all the other chiefs, the paramount chiefs, these are traditional leaders, all spoke in unison that this is what we need. We want our plan that will dictate our development within our chiefdoms. So, wow, are we able to do this? But yes, we trust the process, we'll find a way um, to secure the resources. Then we invited um, the Ebola structures from Kwenadugu and Moyamba. We went to Kwenadugu and Moyamba. We had a similar process. They were all so much involved, saying, this is what we need. We want to lead our own development process. We also designed the, 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 the program in a way that it's more of women-centered. They suffered more or most during the crisis, and we said, let's create a space. Most times, our tradition thinks women don't have um, answers. They are mostly followers. We said, let's flip this um, issue around. Let's give the women the space to lead in their own development. And it was clear. That's how the peace mothers came to being. And they were so much involved in their own community development programs. So as a way to plug the Chief, the local um, development processes, we then went to the district process. And from the district, we tried to link up with the local government, that is through the uh, Ministry of Local Government and, and Rural Development. Now, I'll fast forward to say, this process, to us, is more of an imagined design. We made sure we are not telling the, the communities what to do. We are just accompanying them. We believe that the people have the answers to their problems. And what we try to do is just, okay, how can we accompany you and make the appropriate connections to the central government, to the district um, councils, and to, uh, and to other practitioners. So basically, I, I'm sure the shack is coming very close, but I'll be um, willing to answer to questions moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. So, the message is if, if we want to localize the 2030 agenda, we want to hear what people want because they know what they want. The ownership needs to be embedded in the community. And connecting, I think, was the other point. The, the connecting the dots from the local to the village to the uh, uh, local authority to the national. So I think that that's uh, excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, Libby.
You are the founder of Catalyst of, uh, for Peace. And you know, we want to know why did you decide to focus solely on Sierra Leone? Usually foundations and donors have like a large portfolio and, 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 and have like many, many different priorities. So your approach is also really interesting that you've been in Sierra Leone for the last 10 years? 12 years, yeah. 12 years, wow. Yes. Libby, you have the floor. Yes, thank you, Jimena. And I like that phrase, John, uh, I stand on the previous protocols. <laughs> thank you for saving me from saying all of my thank yous, but one thank you to everybody who's made this event possible. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, our approach at Catalyst for Peace, coming, having come from a professional peace building background before I um, started Catalyst for Peace as a granting and operating foundation, one of the needs that I saw, there was a lot of really good work happening at local levels, but it was isolated and episodic. And uh, to me, what it felt like was it was a huge waste of resources, of the resources of the people and communities most impacted by conflict. And I felt that a huge part of that problem was actually funding, and that funding was project-oriented and event-based. And what I heard coming from the people that we were working with was most necessary was long-term funding um, over time uh, with flexibility to actually create the space uh, over time for local ownership. And so that's what we committed to do. To do. The question that I brought when I, uh, that I was holding core when I started Catalyst for Peace in 2003 is how do you create the space for the people most impacted by war to be the ones who get to lead in the rebuilding after? And not how do you do that in isolated, episodic ways, but how do you do that in systemic and strategically impactful ways? So the question that I was holding is what is the system that supports local ownership and leadership, and how can we actually live into that system. And when I met John Cocker, um, Sierra Leone, he was at a point of frustration with a lack of real reconciliation because he felt that so much of the internationally uh, and nationally led efforts had been focused um, at the national level and very little of it went to the community. And he felt that Sierra Leoneans actually had within their culture and their tradition, their communities, incredible resources to make peace and that they wanted to engage in the, in the reconciliation process. So that's what first brought us together. Um, and he'd been working nationally as a human rights advocate and had the networks nationally. So we said, what would a process owned and led by Sierra Leoneans look like, drawing on their culture and their tradition? And how could we create a space for true local leadership of the reconciliation process at a national scale? ultimately. So that was the first phase of our work. And then um, after Ebola uh, adapted that to a broader um, community-led approach to planning and development. What I want to share most today are the two um, core concepts, sort of theoretical frameworks and uh, concepts that uh, really have underlined uh, the, the way that we've worked and that have emerged from our experience. And I brought some props with me. Um, so. Hopefully, I won't knock down too much up here as I do this. But one of the things that we found is that a community that has a challenge, whether it's, in this case, a, con a community recovering from war or from Ebola or dealing with health crisis or education crisis, whatever it is, is like a cup. And the way the international aid uh, system works is it brings resources to come and address that issue and brings the resources and pours them into the community like the bottle of water. Only what happens? It goes right through the cup. And why is that? Because the community itself is broken. Now, the problem is, if it doesn't work, the aid community says, it didn't work, they need more resources, they need more resources, and pour more resources in, sometimes in a way that actually widens the cracks in the cup. It also depletes the resources of the aid community, right? And they get exhausted from heroic efforts to try to fix the problems. One of the big problems is that the community itself, all the focus is on the problem. The community itself is invisible. The work of repairing the cup is invisible. What Fumble Talk does, it doesn't pour water in. You heard John talking about that. Going into the communities, we don't say, here's money what, you know, for, the, for the problems. Fumble Talk's work is repairing the cup. 
And when you repair the cup, any aid that comes in from the outside stays in the community, and they're able to handle it. And here's the other thing that we've found. When you repair the community, not only can they hold outside aid, but like John was describing in Bondu, in the very place where it was ground zero for Ebola, they begin to come together because you've repaired the cup, you've created the capacity to work together again. They actually tap into resources of groundwater right in the community themselves. That cup becomes like a well. And it taps into the resources that are there that are neglected because the cup container itself has been broken. And they're able to, um, to generate their own resources um, and, and, uh, and um, move forward and address their own problems that way. So that is one core concept. The work, and you heard John describe the work of repairing the cup. That is um, the core of the people's planning process. And we have, if anybody's interested in more specifics, the maps. Uh, that highlight the specifics of that process. One other core concept that I want to, uh, we have found is that. Oh, it's like a magic. Uh, that, I know, I, I, I come here. prepared, I'm gonna stand. <laughs> Hopefully you'll be able to hear me, but um, is that there was also an assumption of separation, and pardon me for taking over more of the table here. Um, but you have a local community, let's now imagine the community is uh, here instead of a, the cup, we have the bowl, right? So here's the local community. People that want to help, you can have local um, structures, whether they're governmental or non-governmental helping, district, state, or national. But they're all separated. And so if they're trying to address this issue, their resources are only able to flow one way, from the outside in. What Fumble Talk, besides repairing the cup from the local community, then is rebuilding the network of the container. So you have, in this case, they gathered people um, into chiefdoms. Gather, after they had done the people's plan, brought them together in the chiefdom and aggregated a chiefdom plan. So that repaired the chiefdom cup. And then you heard John talk about bringing the district folks together. So in addition to the official local government structures, you had all of the government ministries that are located at the district. You had the non-governmental organizations, the traditional leaders, women's leaders, youth leaders, religions, et cetera, um, all coming together and forming an inclusive committee. So this is governance, but led by what the communities are saying they want and designed to support that. The national framework is now the national container that supports this process, right? And so it's designed to bring together the Ministry of Local Government, the Ministry of Planning, all of the other relevant ministries um, to ask how do we work in a way that supports this process? And then you have the international container over um, around. And what this, you often hear um, bottom up versus top down. We don't use those language because in this situation, with this concept governing it, it could, if this is local community and this is international, it could easily be top down depending on how you're looking at it, right? So we use the language of inside out. Instead of an outside in approach, you have an inside out. And so it's this concept of a whole system. There's still all the different sectors, but instead of separated and acting on, they are together and functioning as a whole system with a flow that can go both ways from the outside in. And the role of those on the outside is to create the space that allows the leadership and capacity that's in the inside to come forward. So, thank you. Thank you. I think you've um, exceeded expectations of how creatively to present. I don't think <laughs> and I did IPI not has, ever, <laughs> has ever uh, done uh, this creative uh, approach. Uh, so thank you, thank you so much. It's uh, really inspiring to, to see and to better understand the, the approach. Uh, so last but not least, before we turn to your questions, we will, we will uh, listen to the final remarks from the Minister of Local Government and Rural Development, Mr. Tamba Lamina, please. Uh, you have the floor. You've been uh, for outside of Sierra Leone for 30 years, and now you have come back home. How do you feel coming back, perhaps, to a new Sierra Leone? Thank you. It feels great for a short answer. <laughs> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great honor to be talking to you regarding this very illuminating an intriguing framework. Local governance in Sierra Leone 
has been going on over many years. And there's been tips and troughs throughout these years. Of course, elected local councils were introduced in 2004 with the objective of promoting good governance, democracy, inclusiveness, and accountability. Of course, the devolution process has been ongoing. Many functions have been devolved. But as we're here today, these responsibilities that have been given to local councils haven't been done to the expectation of many. And one of the reasons for that has mainly been the lack of ownership by the people themselves. Local councils have not yet grasped the issue of community ownership and people's ownership. And that is exactly what this framework brings to the table. Consultative processes have been inclusive, but they have been less owned. And what we desire through the One Fambu framework is that inclusivity and the participation of the community. The government is very much in support and committed to ensuring this people's ownership. I want to give you my own personal experience of Fambu Talk. And as you asked, I've been away from the country for nearly 30 years and going back initially as High Commissioner to the UK and then now as local government minister. I wasn't in Sierra Leone during the time of war, although I remain connected. Many of my relatives, of course, from very far away, you could understand how turbulent it was for me being very far away from it. But the first time experience was just two weeks ago when I went back to my home district of Connor District, a diamondiferous land, with Fambu Talk. Fambu Talk held a stakeholders meeting. Connor District is a district, obviously, where there could be tensions. It's a swing state, if you want to call it that way, politically. Um, clearly, what happened in Connor was a vivid example of how you could use the framework in order for people to disclose, to actually bear their souls out. And I sat down there after these many years thinking that this framework does actually work because people are honest, they talk to each other, and at the end of the day, they hug each other. And the element to this now is clearly about correlating the peace aspect to development. And this is exactly where we are going. We had the Minister of uh, Planning and Development state about how the National Development Plan is going to be cascaded. My ministry is going to be very instrumental in actually ensuring that the people's ownership is key to this particular process. Because as a first pillar, I believe ownership of the people is critical, but also as a second pillar, we have capacity building. One family structure provides that robust structure for success in service delivery. It's a radical approach to decentralization. It provides the mechanism for prompt action on poverty alleviation. When communities get involved, they provide objective needs assessment of their own situations identifying priorities and validating those priorities as well. It becomes a convergence between political will provided by the new direction government, which is our government, and community needs as well. Um, it is the people's ask. But once it comes down, it doesn't become um, a political issue or a football between political parties. The dialogue with donors has already started. And it, is, it will be at two levels, of course, with the Ministry of Planning and Development, but also with the Ministry 
of local government. This dialogue will lead to recalibration of undisbursed funds aimed at fulfilling the people's ask. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, donor partners must create the space for supporting people's own strategies, like the One Fumble Talk framework, in order to leverage accountability structures on both sides. It is sustainable and enhances development and indeed enhances peace. Again, we're just about to start the discussion. We'll be here for questions, but my ministry, Ministry of Local Government, would integrate these processes and ensure that development is people-owned. I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for those powerful words. And so colleagues, now we have a, a time for Q&A. We have a microphone here in the front and a microphone here in the back. So please come uh, and, and ask questions from either of those ends. Introduce yourselves and, and please be brief in uh, asking the questions. Who would like to go first? Thank you all, thanks for IPI. Thank you all panelists for this. My name is Christopher Hamblett. Uh, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Sierra Leone in Kailau in the mid 1980s. I also um, 15 years ago started up something called the Foundation for West Africa with two people from West Africa. I'm also on the board of the Independent Radio Network, Sierra Leone's Independent Radio Network. So we are, the foundation is supporting IRN and its member stations at a, at a very local level, community radio. So um, I just wanted to hear your perspectives on the role of community radio in the process you're talking about and in the development of the country. And I'll sit down, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Annie? Yeah. This is a question to Mr. Chambas. You were talking about reducing teenage pregnancy. So I was wondering what kind of initiatives you're doing in order to make that happen. Thanks. Thank you, Anne. Uh, the lady in the, in the, yes, yes. Marta. Buenos dias. Uh, Marta Benavides, El Salvador. The real name is Cuscatan, our indigenous name, means land of riches, and we are very impoverished now. Not poor, impoverished. The question is, uh, we have done all that you're talking about from civil society, and we have documented all that. But when you have, uh, you know, we don't have, we haven't had the uh, great thing that you had, that the administration of governments have joined in this process. In fact, they have pushed us out. They didn't want to understand, and they didn't want to include you know, but the people that chose. The problem is also that when you have a system, a democratic system, where there are so many political parties, they fight the territories. And so when we did the whole process of the SDGs, we said that number 16 should have been the overarching of all. But you know, this is not seen as that, but when you do the SDGs, it's really about living in peace in a healthy environment. So when we went to uh, UNDP, they also told us we already have the people that we have to work with hmm. because we were working with the people that in SDGs are said to be the most excluded, like the First Nations and all that. Then the UN came with the process of localization. And the people said, in Spanish, localization is to look for something that you lost. Yes. And we said, no, we haven't lost anything. You know? And they also said, we know how to solve the problem, indigenous people. So they didn't like the word localization, even though really you have to localize it, bring it to the communities. They said, we need to territorialize it, meaning that whatever, how you're going to measure, it should be by going to where it should happen. Well, the problem is then that you know there are in democracy, I don't call that democracy in that way, but in democracy you have elections and they fight you know, to take the leadership. What happens when you go from a government that maybe an administration of government that is open, you know, to be uh, supportive, but then you know it's another government that comes and they want to destroy everything that the other one did. 
Yes. You know, we have to figure that out. And in terms of the localization, it cannot be that also the territories are fought in there. You know, and then they're in our country now, you know, we have big problems, water privatization and all that. So the questions are, how do we develop a process where we can talk about it so that the people really are able to face up to those things ahead of time, including the fourth, you know, industrial revolution. This is coming and people don't know anything about it and they are pushing this artificial intelligence and all that on us. Thank you, thank you. That's a, a big question, very good question. Uh, Margaret in the back and then we will uh, return to the panel. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm Margaret Williams. Uh, I coordinate the 16 Plus Forum, and we had our previous 2018 showcase in Sierra Leone last year, and so it's just an incredible honor and joy for me to be here and to see all of you, Minister Kai Kai John. Um, it's incredible. Um, so I just have a quick question that in some ways actually piggybacks off the last, um, the last comment and question, which is that um, what do you hope to do next with this local governance model, this inside out approach, um, and then creating this two way communication and inclusive engagement process. And what do you foresee as potential challenges that you're now looking to, to overcome um, in order to maintain um, meaningful and inclusive engagement at all levels? Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, so maybe we can start from uh, SRSG Chambas and we move this way. Uh, yes. Um the UN, uh, we work through the UN FPA, the UN uh, Fund uh, for Population, uh, to support the government uh, of uh, Sierra Leone. We're especially very pleased about the role of the First Lady, who is very active on issues uh, of uh, girl child education. Uh, girl child education is one structural way uh, to prevent. Uh, teenage pregnancy. The longer we can keep uh, girl ch uh, ch uh, children in school, uh, beyond primary, and now uh, government is embarked on ensuring that there's compulsory education through primary, through secondary, and especially for girl child uh, students, pupils, uh, those who especially do well in STEM subjects, they're given a scholarship. There's a free, fee free education program for any girl child who enrolls in STEM subjects beyond the basic level, you know, up to university education. But I will uh, yield the floor to Honorable Al Ghali, uh, who wants to uh, take the floor at this point. Thank you. Thank you, SRSG. Minister Francis? Yes. Um, just to add to what the ERSG has said. There's the education approach, but there's also the legal approach. Government has recently passed a new Sexual Offenses Act because teenage sex is an offense. There has to be an age of consent. So government has recently passed a Sexual Offenses Act, which, would, which has, is a more robust law than what currently exists to prevent teenage pregnancy and to litigate those who have been engaged in maybe, because sometimes the pregnancies arise as a result of uh, non-consensual sex, particularly among teenage girls. Most of the time, it's as a result of non-consensual sex. So government has recently um, amended the Sexual Offenses Act to address this issue. There's also a teenage uh, pregnancy secretariat in the office of the First Lady, and they, they like coordinate um, all the actions that government is taking on teenage pregnancy. And there's also a support system whereby teenage pregnant girls have where to go when they have all of these problems. And that support system is also based in the office of the First Lady to address this issue. So it's really a high priority on the agenda of the government education, legal uh, uh, provisions, and a support system to address the issue. Thank you. Excellent, thank you so much. Libby? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm not sure that I can respond to all of them, and nor do I need to, but a couple of points that I would love to, to make. 
Um, and maybe I'll start in a, a, from the end and work back. Um, what do we see as challenges? One of the major challenges in the context of Sierra Leone right now is, um, and I'll use my visual image. So we have, with the framework, we've developed a whole system that includes all the actors that are working functionally. We've been the primary funder of it to date, and our funding has come to an end, and we're bringing in other funders. This kind of a system is not very visible from the lenses of most international funders. And funding requirements, and this goes to the process that you're describing in your experience in El Salvador also, um, often require, because the agendas are just being set by international donors, or they have other partners that they're already working with, the effect of that would be to split this whole system apart again and keep it fragmented. And so I think one of the real needs is to foster genuine hard conversation among the donor community about how to work in ways that, first of all, recognizes a holistic process in, when it already exists, and that understands the value in the process of how to create one and support one when it, when it doesn't. Um, and Minister Lamina was talking about the work that he's already doing right now, coordinating donors. Um, Technically, uh, the government has the authority over the major international donors. But in practice, it just really hasn't worked that way. And so the government now is stepping into you know, more fully, it's describing the ways it's stepping into its authority and saying, and the framework is designed to be a tool for that, to say we have this process, um, and to direct towards supporting the process. The other thing that's not visible is process. We focus on problem, and we focus on product. Both of those ignore process. And so until we make process visible and a priority, and we understand that good process yields good products and solves problems, until we get to that point, we're never going to really make long-term progress. So, so that's another thing. Um, and it connects to what we would hope to do, to do next. And I guess and indirectly, I don't want to take up any more time. I can come back to that more if we, if we want to, but I know others will have important responses too. Great, great. And I think you, you touch on a great point, you know, and this is why in today's event, even though it's focused on the 2030 agenda, we didn't touch upon a, 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 a silo approach to SDG per SDG per SDG, but we're talking about the, the container that contains all the SDGs. So yes. I think it's really a valuable conversation. Minister Kaika, you're next. Thank you very much. Very good questions. Um, yeah, well, I'll attempt to answer a few of them. Uh, first of all, the issue of, uh, I go back to the SDGs. You are right. We need to treat them in a very wholesome way. Uh, it's difficult to pick and choose. You know, all 17 goals are interlinked in many ways. And so is our national development plan. You know, it's done that way deliberately to ensure that uh, all sectors are involved. And in this process of trying to uh, take the plan to the people, you know, taking that plan to the people. We want a whole of society approach. You know, uh, the Minister of Local Government just mentioned there is need for greater coordination, even amongst government. I mean, the government ministries, the departments, the agencies, we all need to come together at that level. I mean, to make sure we can recognize the need for an integrated approach. We are going to ensure that. Our development partners, they should, they should see this example from government. And we want to make sure they are with us, you know, when we go down to that level as a government. So it's going to happen. And that's how the P, that's the next direction for the PPP. I already spoke to John. He said, John, you've done a great job in three districts. Now what we need to do is to make sure that we use this methodology, you know, to ensure that, you know, those different levels are brought together and stay in a cohesive way so that we have a, a, a proper coordination mechanism at district level. And it should stay there, you know, so that our local councils can really make sure that uh, they take that as an approach that going forward. So that way you bring process and product together. Yes. Because as a government, you also want to deliver. And you deliver, you deliver in certain uh, products, you know, which people have to see and relate to, you know, because, uh, 
clearly you made a promise. And our president is very, very keen on making sure that uh, we deliver on the promises made to the people already. So the product and the process will come together because we, we believe they will reinforce each other somehow. And we hope that uh, in the longer term, uh, we are talking about people really changing their mindset and knowing that development is owned by them and that their input into it is important and that products could come from outside, but they have to make sure they organize for it. And I keep saying one thing all the time, that in an organized society, on that basis, $1,000 can go a very far distance in helping the society that has no cracks. Once you fix those cracks, $1,000 can go a very, very long way in assisting people. But if those cracks continue, clearly even with $100 million, it will just be, you know. So this is what we have seen, and this is where the local approach and the national approach, we are beginning to see in the same direction. And I really hope that, uh, John, we can work together on this. And we're going to make sure all the civil society groups working at the decentralized level and government will come together to do this. And once our development partners see this, I am sure they will come on board. So this is not about now the international level. We want the international level to follow us as Sierra Leoneans, yes. you know, as we forge this going forward. Quickly on community radios, thank you very much. IRN has been great in Sierra Leone. I mean, I can attest to that, and I'm sure everybody, all Sierra Leoneans, because, uh, you know, this is really a revolution in, in, uh, in communication. And uh, community radios are democratizing information, you know, because societies that were marginalized before that did not even hear about the national events can now hear in their villages. There is more to go, of course. We need to do more because uh, we don't have uh, uh, connectivity everywhere. And also receptions are poor in many parts of rural Sierra Leone. You know, so we hope that the help you are providing for IRN will continue. But they need more, uh, more um, uh, I, th I think they need to have better technology that covers a bit more. And this is an area where we definitely need support um, so that rural connectivity will be really on the agenda. Because it's helping to democratize so many things, even the peace process that our SRS just spoke about, um, even the plans we are talking about now. We need the radio to accompany us so that more and more people can get because it's, it's the cheapest means of communicating to the people right now. So it's been a great, uh, great thing. Uh, now, uh, succession, democratic succession, has been a problem also uh, for for us. Uh, you mentioned the issue of uh, one government changing hands to another, and maybe the good things be done by one, they are abandoned by the other, mm -hmm. and so on. We've had our own experience with that as well, with even the decentralization process. Um, it was introduced, as the minister said, in, in 2004. You know, up to a while, it was there was a big fanfare about it. Some of us are believers in it. You know, but then, if you have a government succeeding that is that believes more in centralization, there becomes an issue. Even support to the local locally elected officials becomes an issue, and it is an issue right now we have in front of us in Sierra Leone. You know, how can we compensate locally elected officials? So that they become committed, you know, to the to this process. It's a real challenge, and I think we have a colleague there, Mr. Bonafa. He is a direct, uh, I would say, victim of this, because he knows exactly what it means when you are locally elected and not fully supported by the center, you know, maybe for political reasons or or or, or something. Else. So, it's an issue. Um, we have to grapple with it, even in this process. And, uh, and that's why I think support of the international community for our processes, I mean, will be really very important at, the, at this stage. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much for touching upon so many of the different questions. It's amazing. John? Thank you. I will just take one of the questions. That's how do we ensure cooperation between civil society and government? Um, our experience, I have been a human rights advocate for 20 three years or so. And this is the first time to really cooperate with the national government. I can tell you it has to do with your sense of sincerity and making sure that you are not seen as being political. You don't have a hidden agenda. Also, what you take to the government is not your agenda. You are merely linking what the people want 
their needs to the government. It's the demand and supply. And I think that works very well. But there is a risk. You know, the timing can be a little bit of a challenge. We started this cooperation with the previous government. And then close to elections, we saw, we, we actually observed some manipulation. We had to go back to the drawing board to say, hey, let's stop. We stop, hold on, after elections, then we re-engage. We went to the previous government um, minister, say, hey, better luck next time. And we went to the new government, say, look, this is what we have been doing. This is what the people want to do. We would like to engage. So it's more how you approach and your history. If you are seen as someone who is political, forget it. And you should not be too aggressive. It's more of sometimes you massage the message until they get it. And I must tell you that if you really work on it, they will get it. Take away your personal self. And the issue of the community radio, it's key. The peace mothers, we are very much at the center of nonviolence campaign during the elections. They use the community radios. And it also helps to demystify the concept of radio station. You know, getting these ordinary village women to the radio stations to talk. They call their children, listen to me on the radio, I'm talking tonight. It just helps them to sort of feel belong. They plugged into the national conversation. And when these women talk to their husbands, to their kids, either through radio, it's easy to amplify that, or in person, they get the message. Look, we are all one country. Let's see how we can avoid violence. Whatever happens, we need to move on. Um, what needs to be happening? What do we need to do next? I think the minister, the minister has answered that. Um, the challenge is, it's how do we keep this process national? How do we navigate the political challenges? Because it's easy for the previous government to say, hey, look, look, the, we want to blah, blah, blah. And it's more of a challenge. Um, but I believe with a sense of sincerity, we in, I mean, with the hope we have, with the ministers presently, who will try to put the people first. This is not about our agenda. It's about the people's agenda. Let them lead, and we support them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to particularly appreciate um, all of you coming here uh, this morning. Uh, but I want to refer to one of the questions asked earlier, which is, um, the issue of resistance and ownership. Now, I firmly believe that when it is truly owned, nobody can take it away from you. Mm. Because if the people believe in it, and they uh, bought the idea, and it's instilled, then definitely it cannot be taken away. Mm. So one family framework is the way forward and uh, with regards to moving it forward. Uh, currently, as I speak, there's a process on the way in reviewing the Local Government Act. Um, and the Local Government Act will be reviewed and we believe firmly that the One Family Framework is one of the methodologies that we're gonna be using uh, to actually consult uh, with the people as to what sort of local governance they actually want to see. Um, to me, Having been in the country for about three months, uh, this process, this framework, has left such an indelible imprint on my mind that Sierra Leone is moving forward. And if the development process is to be owned by the people, then no government, whether government changes from today to tomorrow, can take it away from the people because it will be the people's planning process. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much to all our panel. I think they deserve a round of applause. <laughs> IPI, together with its partners, will be convening a, a, a meeting on what works and localizing the 2030 agenda in Gambia in next month. So please stay tuned and thank you. <laughs>